So today we enter into the fifth week already. Um, we've been uh, going through Ephesians chapter 6, and specifically we've been looking at the armor of God that Paul describes as something that we are to, to put on so that we might stand against the schemes of the devil. Right? We're calling this series Battle Ready because we want to be ready for battle. Because whether you signed up for it or not, whether you're aware of it or not, as God's people, you're engaged in a spiritual battle. Right? We are at, at, at war against spiritual forces of wickedness, the scripture says. And so we want to be battle ready. We want to be taken out. We want to, we want to thrive in the midst of battle. And so just by a quick review, we, we recognize clearly we, we are in a battle. It's a spiritual assault on God's people to get them to believe lies that's the tool in his, in his belt. That's the tool in Satan's arsenal. His goal is to get us to believe lies that keep us from seeing ourselves or God or the world around us the way God wants us to see it. Satan's weapons are lies. These lies, when believed, they cause actions. Right? They're not just lies that take place in a bubble, but when lies are believed, they cause actions. Actions produce behaviors. Behaviors over time become strongholds that lead us further and further away from God's design for us. His weapon is lies. Our weapon is truth. Truth is the only way to combat a lie. Amen? Amen? The only way to expose a lie as a lie is the holding it up against truth. And truth, like a lie, when believed, it too causes actions. Those actions create behaviors. These behaviors align us to what God says about us, about himself, and about the world around us. It puts in motion our ability to live lives of truth. The truth that we appropriate in our lives, it finds its source not in the wisdom of the world, not in man's experience. Let me tell you the things I've learned. This is, this is what I think is true. Um, don't you love when people say that? Well, that might be true to you, but it's not true to me. What is that? That's called an opinion, right? Opinions don't mean anything. Truth, God's truth, is true for all times, for all people, in every generation, in every place. God's truth does not change. And so this truth that we talk about, it finds its source in God. And specifically, we find its source in the Word of God. And so really, this is a, this is a series on, on appropriating the Word of God into our lives. That's what the battle is about. And Paul will go to very creative ways, ways under the inspiration of the Spirit, certainly, to present to us this armor, this whole armor, to help us to understand how do we rightly appropriate God's word in our lives. And so he gives us pictures, he gives us, he gives us um, um, armor, he gives us these ideas to help us to understand how do we live out the word of God. And as we live out the word of God, that is what equips us and enables us to be battle ready. And so we've been looking at this these last couple of weeks. And Paul is he's obviously using this metaphor of a soldier that's dressed and ready in his battle armor. And he calls us as soldiers of Christ to likewise put on the whole armor of God. So that we too, who are in a battle might stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, we looked at the belt of truth a couple weeks back. Truth, again, that, that comes from God. It's revealed in his word. And we are to take that truth and we are to wrap that truth around us like a belt. Right? In the same way that a belt holds all things together, so too truth wraps around our lives and it holds all things together. Everything is to be held together by the truth of God's word. 
That truth affects the way we live, the way we think, and the way we speak. Now, last week we looked at the breastplate of righteousness. This piece of armor that, that covers our chest area, the main purpose is to cover the vital organs of our body, and more specifically, the heart, which has long been understood as the, as the center point of our emotions. And so while the belt of truth helps us to, or defines for us how we ought to live and think and, and speak, the breastplate of righteousness informs the way in which we are to feel. It, it, it helps us to understand how we are to see ourselves. The breastplate of righteousness points to our position before God as loved and accepted solely on the merits of Christ's righteousness that is applied to our lives. The enemy loves to make us feel like we are less than what God says we are. He loves to operate and assault our emotions. Well, you didn't pray enough. You're not in the word enough. You're not going to the church enough. You're not doing this enough. Are you really a Christian? And what he wants to do is he tries to get Christians to think that they are only as good as their performance. And the moment he can get a Christian thinking that their standing is only as good as their performance, when they blow it, they throw the whole towel in. It's a scheme of the devil. The reality of it is our standing before God is based on performance, but not our performance, but the performance of Christ on the cross. We stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ who did everything we possibly needed so that we might attain the righteousness of Christ. And so we, we wear that truth as a breastplate. We guard our emotions so when those moments come, and it doesn't happen, I know, to anybody here, but those moments where you start to feel like, I'm such a loser. I'm not as spiritual as this one or that one. I didn't do this, I didn't do that. And we start getting caught up in the, the oh me's and the oh my's kind of thing. And, and we start to fail to recognize that, man, we're a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're God's own special people. When we start feeling less than what we are, he's setting us up to live like we're less than we really are. And so that breastplate, it guards our emotions. It makes us realize, no, I don't care how I feel. I stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And based on what Christ has done for me, I am loved, I am accepted. And so now as we come to this next article that, that Paul will hold up for us, it's, it's very important as we move into this next piece that we consider and take a moment of pause to consider why is Paul writing this? What is the, anytime we read the scripture, we need to take a moment and consider what is God saying here? Right? What is God saying here? Not what do I think he's saying. No, what is God saying? What's the motive behind? What's the goal behind what Paul's writing is? And I think in this particular article, um, it's very important for us to just take a moment and consider first, what is Paul saying and why is he saying this? Let's go back to our text in, in Ephesians chapter 6 and, and verse 10. Here's what Paul writes. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the, de of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. What a picture we get of that, right? Therefore, he says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, which we'll look at this morning, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. What's, what's the drive uh, of, of what Paul's writing. What's the motive? What is, why is Paul giving us this instruction? It's interesting. Four times in these verses, he makes reference to standing. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that you may be able to stand. He says it again. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. And then he says it again, fourth time. That, that uh, having done all to stand... 
And then he says again, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. We see four times in this small section of scripture that Paul is giving us the, the reason behind the teaching that he's giving to us. It's so that we would be equipped to know how to stand. This isn't about advancement. This isn't about going forward. This is about standing. How do we stand against the schemes of the devil? It's very significant because I don't know about you, but, but I've seen some really extreme teachings come out of this text of scripture and, and weird books written and movies made, right? That kind of, kind of have this very cosmic look to what spiritual warfare is all about. And hey, there's a lot going on there, but let's not forget the reason, the context of what Paul is saying here is we are being equipped so that we would know how to stand. This isn't about how to go after the devil. This isn't about how we learn how to, how do we kick his butt, right? How do we put, how do we rub his nose in failure? How do we seek him out and, and destroy him? No, this passage of scripture is about how we, how we stand. Because in the end of the day, the battle is the Lord's. And as Augustine said, the devil is God's devil. He's on a, he, he, he's got limits to what he can do. And outside of Christ, you and I couldn't do anything to stand against him. We are powerless outside of Christ to stand against the enemy. If that wasn't necessary, if we, if we can stand against the devil on our own strength, we wouldn't see so much scripture that's laid before us that calls us to be, to be aware of his presence and his influence and how to stand against him. And so this entire section, as picturesque and as helpful as it is with all of the armor, it's about how to stand as a victorious child of God in a fallen world. Because I don't know about you, but as time goes on, I find myself feeling less and less like I don't belong here. I don't think like the world does. I don't value the things that the world values. I, I don't put my same priorities as the world does around. I just look at it as time goes on and on. I'm, being, I'm becoming more and more, real, uh, more and more aware of the fact that I truly am a, I'm a pilgrim passing through. Man, this place is not my home. I love it here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, by God's grace, everything I can while I've got breath in my lungs to make an influence in the world around me for Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you what, I'm looking to a heavenly country. I mean, there's something that's ahead for us that we need to realize that all that's going on around us, man, it's, this is just the playing field. It's about where we're going. It's about where we're going. Paul instructs us on how to stand against the schemes of the devil. You know what? We're on a mission. We're on a mission to reach lost people, not go after fallen angels. Right? So many times I'll see people get so caught up in spiritual warfare that more time is spent going after fallen angels than reaching lost people. You and I are on a mission to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world around us. And if the enemy can distract us from our ultimate mission of reaching people for Jesus Christ, then you know what? That's part of his strategy. That's part of his scheming. We're on a mission to reach people for Jesus. And in the midst of that mission, in the midst of that war, the enemy is going to try and stop us by lying, hoping that we'll believe it. And Paul lays out for us, here's how you stand against these schemes of the devil. Notice this, this next article of armor obviously has everything to do with standing as we talk about the shoes. And it ties so beautifully with the preceding articles that we've been looking at, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. We need to remember that each of the articles that we're looking at, they're not intended to be um, uh, seen as just one piece, but it's a, it's a part of a whole. They all tie in together. It's all one part of a, of, 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 a, of a strategy so that we might be able to stand. We have the, the source of truth wrapped around us, 
right? The belt of truth, it, it informs how we live and how we think and how we speak. We have the, the breastplate of righteousness covering our heart, covering the center point of our emotions. It informs us how to feel. It exposes those lies that cause us to reject how we shouldn't feel. And now Paul says, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now I want to point something to your attention here. This passage here, this section, this piece, this isn't so much about the shoes as it is about the readiness. The shoes are just the example. The focus, the emphasis is not on the shoes, it's on the readiness. As shoes put on readiness. It's not about the shoes. It's about the readiness. And so we're going to focus on what is the readiness that Paul makes reference to. I mean, the soldiers' shoes, they're extremely important. They're extremely important in times of, of battle. I mean, the Roman military, when they created these special shoes that they used in war, it became a real game changer. It allowed them to stand against their enemies that, in ways that they never were able to, be, to do it before. There were these boots that were made of, of strong leather, and they'd kind of wrap halfway up their calf. And, and, but the real game changer wasn't the leather and the straps, but it was one of, what was underneath the sole. There'd be these metal studs. I think we have a picture of them up here. It wasn't an actual one, but it's kind of the idea. But it had these metal studded um, spikes that allowed them to, to stand their ground so that when they were engaging in war, they wouldn't be pushed by the enemy. They wouldn't lose their footing because you know what happens, ends up happening when you lose your footing, you lose your balance. When you lose your battle, your balance, you lose the war. And so what they would do is they put on these shoes and they would plant themselves in the ground and made, made them virtually immovable to the ongoing push of the enemy. Now, we'd call these things cleats, right? Or spikes. I mean, to us, it's kind of like, of course you would do that. But to them, this was revolutionary. And it was a major, it was a game changer for them. I mean, you ever, you know, they, 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 like they, they dig their feet in, right? And, and they'd lock themselves firmly onto the ground and they were immovable. You ever walk around like a pergo floor or a wood floor with like thick socks on? It's like, you know, you go push something, you do that Michael Jackson thing, like, whoa, hey, I can't, I've got no footing going on here at all. I, I didn't do the moonwalk. I don't know how to do it. But I know somebody looked at it. Uh, but, but if you don't have clear footing, man, you then you, if you don't have clear footing, then you don't have clear standing. Right? And then you are like that double-minded man that James talks about who's driven and tossed by the winds, right? And, and let not that man think he should receive anything from the Lord. And so what, what, the, what the Roman soldier had was these special shoes that allowed them to kind of plant their feet in the ground so that when the push came in, the schemes of the enemy came in, they stood there planted on the ground in which they stood. These studded sandals, they, they made them virtually immovable during attack. And Paul's saying, likewise, those shoes, the things that will make you virtually immovable to attack, the thing that will cause you to stand against the schemes of the devil is not the metal studded shoes, but readiness. Readiness, awareness. Readiness. As shoes put on readiness. In other words, what he's saying here is it's taking all that we've learned about the belt of truth, it's taking all that we've learned about the, the breastplate of righteousness and applying it into our life in such a way that it moves from head knowledge to battle strategy. It's taking it from information to strategy and saying, wait a second, I'm going to take that belt of truth. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what is posted out there. This is what God's word says, and I'm wrapping myself around that truth. I don't care how I feel. I stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and I'm planting myself on that truth, immovable to the popular opinion of the day or the schemes of the devil. And when we do that, we stand ready to put in motion these truths that God has created. It's planting your feet so firmly in truth that there's no room for a lie. 
Now, just to to make it really practical, I see Christians all the time that are struggling in so many different ways. Why? Because they let go of truth sometimes and they venture into areas that they don't belong. And it's like, this isn't the way, you know, God gives us, uh, God gives us rules. God gives us instruction. God raises our awareness to the things that we should and shouldn't do. Why? Not to keep us from enjoying life, but to protect us so that, he might, that we might flourish and thrive in this life. But the moment we let go of truth, when the moment we unloosen that belt and we start allowing in the popular opinion of the day and start moving in directions, we lose our footing and we become vulnerable to attack. People say, well, that's very narrow-minded. Hey, it's a narrow way. It's a narrow way. So many people are so open-minded, their brains fall out. We need, to be, we need to be careful to make sure that our mind is being informed by the word of God that does not change. Planting your feet so firmly in truth that there's no room for a lie. It's the readiness. It's the game face. I mean, it's go time, right? You ever see the horse at the gate just waiting for that gate to open, ready for the big race? You just kind of, there's that readiness that's there. For those of you who are in sports or other kinds of things, you're waiting for the bell to go or the horn to blow or the sound to thing. Like you just wait, there's this awareness, this preparedness that you just, you know it's time. It's kind of like what Peter said, listen, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because the devil prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's not there to freak us out or to f- make us fearful, but to raise your awareness. And likewise, we employ these truths from God's word in such a way that when those, those schemes of the devil are launched in our direction, it doesn't catch us by surprise. Why? Because we've been waiting for it. We've been waiting for it. Our response ought to be, I was, waiting for, I was waiting for that thought to come. I was waiting for that person to tell me I should do this. There's an awareness, there's a readiness that we ought to have in place so that these truths get lived out in our lives. It's interesting what Paul says here. It's the readiness, right? But he says it, 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 it's this readiness that helps us to extinguish Those lies, or as Paul calls it, the gospel of peace, right? It's this readiness to the gospel of peace. I I find it interesting that in the midst of all of this discussion of warfare and battle armor and heavenly host of wickedness in the spirit, and we've got this picture of chaos that Paul now brings to our awareness, the gospel of peace. Peace. Our world, our world needs peace. People need peace. And you see, the, the gospel is a the gospel is a gospel of, of peace. Just just listening, some I, some to some I'm sure are listening that and are thinking to themselves, I can't even identify with that word peace. Because you're up nights and you're you're stressed out and you're, you're wondering what tomorrow is going to hold and lacking that peace, but the gospel brings peace. When sin entered into the world, chaos was the result. Everything that God created as good was affected when sin entered into the world. All of the sickness, all of the disease, all of the hatred, all of the the divisions and the despair, all of the chaos that we see so prevalent in the world today is a result of sin in the world. I want you to know that things are not as they were designed to be. This world in which we have, there's some beautiful parts to it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a gloom, doom guy. But man, I'll tell you what, we're not living this place as it was designed to be lived. The feelings of disconnectedness, the feelings of hopelessness, that those feelings of guilt and, and shame, that's, that's not what God wants 
for you. That's not how you were designed to exist, but sin has affected everything in the world around us, and it has affected everything within us, being born sinners. But when the gospel of peace is embraced, then man is no longer under the the penalty of sin. Because the penalty of sin brings chaos. It brings separation. It keeps, brings distance. The penalty of sin is the fact that I cannot be in communion and fellowship with God. And it's broken and it brings chaos. But when I embrace the gospel of peace, the penalty of sin is, is broken over my life. When I embrace the gospel of peace, the the power of sin is broken over my life as well. The power of sin, we see it played out in, in addictions and strongholds and, and broken lives and broken relationships and, and everything else. We see a, these, these broken lives as a result of the power of sin in people. But I'll tell you what, as we embrace the gospel of peace, The power of sin is broken over our life. Romans chapter six, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer in it? We're we're reminded that the power of sin has been broken over our lives because of the gospel of peace. And the day is coming when not only will the penalty of sin be gone, and the power of sin be eradicated, but so too will the presence of sin. And it's on that day where we will step out of time and into eternity, and we will experience life in the sun the way we were designed to experience it. And the presence of sin will be gone, and we'll see him who came for us, who died for us, who lives for us, and we'll see him face to face. And the presence of sin will be gone. And there will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more tears. There will be no more death. All of the chaos and the the fruit of sin in the world will be gone as Satan and his minions are kicked into the lake of fire and they spend all of eternity there. And the presence of sin is gone. That's our heavenly country. That's where we're going. That's what awaits the child of God. But until that time, we battle. Until that time, we're aware. Until that time, we're ready. We're taking the the truths of our heavenly country, the truths of heaven, and we're applying them in this world that might make so much nonsense to the world around us. The scripture says that the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to those who believe, don't believe. But to those who believe, it is the power of God. God has revealed in his word that everything we need so that we might stand is, at, is there for us in the truth of his word. He's given us everything we need so that we might stand against the schemes of the devil. We must be poised and ready to employ, to appropriate truth into our lives, to obey the commands of, of, of scripture, to, to know what the word of God says. I love what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, which is kind of akin to what we're talking about. He says in Matthew chapter 27, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, he just got done preaching the the Sermon on the Mount and laid out truth for for them and then said, if anyone who hears these words of mine and does them, he's like a wise man who built his house on a rock. He's, He's like a wise man who dug his hands in the sand that put his shoes on and was immovable. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, it did not fall. Why? Because it was founded upon the rock. It was founded upon truth. And I think the winds and the, wind, and the, the winds that blow and the, all those things that are, that are launched out there to try to take out the house, those are the, the schemes of the devil. And Jesus said, everyone who does not hear 
these words of mine, everyone who does hear these words of mine and doesn't do them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and its fall was great. It's this idea of not being ready, of not taking truth that's available to us and appropriating it into our lives so when the schemes of the devil come, it takes them out. So the challenge is what? Ready yourself. Stand strong. Plant your feet firmly, not on shifting sand, but on the immovable, unshakable truth of God's word. As shoes for your feet, having put on readiness given by the gospel of peace. Just like all the other articles of armor, the readiness that we are to put on is given by or informed by the gospel of peace, the word of God. We stand strong in the truth of God's word, planted on the solid ground of God's unchangeable truth. We wrap God's unchangeable truth around us like a belt that holds all things together, and this truth informs the way we think, we live, and we feel. We take and protect our emotions by putting on the breastplate of righteousness, knowing that our position before God is not based on our works, but upon the work of Christ, and it guards the way we feel. And then we take these truths. We put them on like those metal-studded sandals, and we plant our feet in that truth so that we might stand our ground as the lying assaults are lodged our way. The breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, and as shoes, the readiness of the gospel of peace. That's some of the armor, but that's not all of the armor. We're going to continue next week on how do we appropriate the word of God into our life. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your word. Truly, it is a lamp unto our feet, and a light unto our path. It, it, it teaches us, it leads us, it guides us, it informs us, instructs us on the way to go. Lord, may we be people who are ready. That we would be doers of the word and not hearers only. That we take these truths and be immovable with them. As people who are planted on the rock of Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.